The Great Kineplatz Experiment Of all the sciences which have puzzled the sons of men, none had such an attraction for the learned Professor von Baumgarten as those which relate to psychology and the ill-defined relations between mind and matter. A celebrated anatomist, a profound chemist, and one of the first physiologists in Europe, it was a relief for him to turn from these subjects and to bring his varied knowledge to bear upon the study of the soul and the mysterious relationship of spirits. At first, when, as a young man, he began to dip into the secrets of mesmerism, his mind seemed to be wandering in a strange land where all was chaos and darkness, save that here and there some great unexplainable and disconnected fact loomed out in front of him. As the years passed, however, and as the worthy professor's stock of knowledge increased, for knowledge begets knowledge as money bears interest, much which had seemed strange and unaccountable began to take another shape in his eyes. New trains of reasoning became familiar to him, and he perceived connecting links where all had been incomprehensible and startling. By experiments which extended over twenty years, he obtained a basis of facts upon which it was his ambition to build up a new exact science which should embrace mesmerism, spiritualism, and all cognate subjects. In this he was much helped by his intimate knowledge of the more intricate parts of animal physiology, which treat of nerve currents and the working of the brain. For Alexis von Baumgarten was Regis Professor of Physiology at the University of Kineplatz, and had all the resources of the laboratory to aid him in his profound researches. Professor von Baumgarten was tall and thin, with a hatchet face and steel-grey eyes which were singularly bright and penetrating. Much thought had furrowed his forehead and contracted his heavy eyebrows so that he appeared to wear a perpetual frown, which often misled people as to his character, for though austere, he was tender-hearted. He was popular among the students, who would gather round him after his lectures and listen eagerly to his strange theories. Often he would call for volunteers from amongst them in order to conduct some experiment, so that eventually there was hardly a lad in the class who had not, at one time or another, been thrown into a mesmeric trance by his professor. Of all these young devotees of science, there was none who equalled in enthusiasm Fritz von Hartmann. It had often seemed strange to his fellow students that wild, reckless Fritz, as dashing a young fellow as ever hailed from the Rhinelands, should devote the time and trouble which he did in reading up abstruse works and assisting the professor in his strange experiments. The fact was, however, that Fritz was a knowing and long-headed fellow. Months before he had lost his heart to young Elise, the blue-eyed, yellow-haired daughter of the lecturer. Although he had succeeded in learning from her lips that she was not indifferent to his suit, he had never dared to announce himself to her family as a formal suitor. Hence he would have found it a difficult matter to see his young lady had he not adopted the expedient of making himself useful to the professor, by this means he frequently was asked to the old man's house, where he willingly submitted to be experimented upon in any way, as long as there was a chance of his receiving one bright glance from the eyes of Elise or one touch of her little hand. Young Fritz von Hartmann was a handsome lad enough. There were broad acres, too, which would descend to him when his father died. To many he would have seemed an eligible suitor. But Madame frowned upon his presence in the house and lectured the professor at times on his allowing such a wolf to prowl around their lamb. To tell the truth, Fritz had an evil name in Kineplatz. 
never was there a riot or a duel or any other mischief afoot, but the young Rhinelander figured as a ringleader in it. No one used more free and violent language, no one drank more, no one played cards more habitually, no one was more idle, save in the one solitary subject. No wonder, then, that the good Frau Professorin gathered her Fräulein under her wing and resented the attentions of such a mauvais sujet. As to the worthy lecturer, he was too much engrossed by his strange studies to form an opinion upon the subject one way or the other. For many years there was one question which had continually obtruded itself upon his thoughts. All his experiments and his theories turned upon a single point. A hundred times a day the professor asked himself whether it was possible for the human spirit to exist apart from the body for a time, and then to return to it once again. When the possibility first suggested itself to him, his scientific mind had revolted from it. It clashed too violently with preconceived ideas and prejudices of his early training. Gradually, however, as he proceeded farther and farther along the pathway of original research, his mind shook off its old fetters and became ready to face any conclusion which could reconcile the facts. There were many things which made him believe that it was possible for mind to exist apart from matter. At last it occurred to him that by a daring and original experiment the question might be definitely decided. It is evident he remarked in his celebrated article upon invisible entities, which appeared in the Kindplatz Wekundlich Medical Schrift about this time, and which surprised the whole scientific world, it is evident that under certain conditions the soul or mind does separate itself from the body. In the case of a mesmerized person, the body lies in a cataleptic condition, but the spirit has left it. Perhaps you reply that the soul is there, but in a dormant condition. I answer that this is not so, otherwise how can one account for the condition of clairvoyance, which has fallen into disrepute through the knavery of certain scoundrels, but which can easily be shown to be an undoubted fact. I have been able myself, with a sensitive subject, to obtain an accurate description of what was going on in another room, or another house. How can such knowledge be accounted for on any hypothesis, save that the soul of the subject has left the body and is wandering through space? For a moment it is recalled by the voice of the operator, and says what it has seen and then wings its way once more through the air. Since the spirit is by its very nature invisible, we cannot see these comings and goings, but we see their effect in the body of the subject, now rigid and inert, now struggling to narrate impressions which could never have come to it by natural means. There is only one way which I can see by which the fact can be demonstrated, Although we in the flesh are unable to see these spirits, yet our own spirits, could we separate them from the body, would be conscious of the presence of others. It is my intention, therefore, shortly to mesmerize one of my pupils. I shall then mesmerize myself in a manner which has become easy to me, after that, if my theory holds good, my spirit will have no difficulty in meeting and communing with the spirit of my pupil, both being separated from the body. I hope to be able to communicate the result of this interesting experiment in an early number of the Kindplatz Wekundlich Medical Schrift. When the good professor finally fulfilled his promise and published an account of what occurred, the narrative was so extraordinary that it was received with general incredulity. The tone of some of the papers was so offensive in their comments upon the matter 
though the angry savant declared that he would never open his mouth again or refer to the subject in any way, a promise which he has faithfully kept. This narrative has been compiled, however, from the most authentic sources, and the events cited in it may be relied upon as substantially correct. It happened then that shortly after the time when Professor von Baumgarten conceived the idea of the above-mentioned experiment, he was walking thoughtfully homewards after a long day in the laboratory, when he met a crowd of roistering students who had just streamed out from a beer-house. At the head of them, half intoxicated and very noisy, was young Fritz von Hartmann. The professor would have passed them, but his pupil ran across and intercepted him. "'Hey, my worthy master,' he said, taking the old man by the sleeve and leading him down the road with him. "'There is something that I have to say to you, and it is easier for me to say it now, when the good beer is humming in my head, than at another time.' "'What is it, then, Fritz?' the physiologist asked, looking at him in mild surprise. "'I hear, mein Herr, that you were about to do some wondrous experiment in which you hoped to take a man's soul out of his body, and then to put it back again. Is it not so?' "'It is true, Fritz. And have you considered, my dear sir, that you may have some difficulty in finding someone on whom to try this? Pots thou send. Suppose that the soul went out and would not come back. That would be a bad business. Who is to take the risk?' "'But Fritz!' the professor cried, very much startled by this view of the matter. "'I had relied upon your assistance in the attempt. Surely you will not desert me. Consider the honour and glory. Consider the fiddlesticks!' the student cried angrily. "'Am I to be paid always thus? Did I not stand two hours upon a glass insulator while you poured electricity into my body? Have you not stimulated my phrenic nerves?' besides ruining my digestion with a galvanic current round my stomach. Four and thirty times you have mesmerised me, and what have I got from all this? Nothing. Now you wish to take my soul out, as you would take the works from a watch. It is more than flesh and blood can stand. Dear, dear, the professor cried in great distress. That is very true, Fritz. I never thought of it before. If you can but suggest how I can compensate you, you will find me ready and willing. Then listen, said Fritz solemnly. If you will pledge your word that after this experiment I may have the hand of your daughter, then I am willing to assist you. But if not, I shall have nothing to do with it. These are my only terms. And what would my daughter say to this? the professor exclaimed after a pause of astonishment. "'Elise would welcome it,' the young man replied. "'We have loved each other long.' "'Then she shall be yours,' the physiologist said with decision, "'for you are a good-hearted young man, and one of the best neurotic subjects that I have ever known. That is when you are not under the influence of alcohol. My experiment is to be performed upon the fourth of next month.' You will attend at the physiological laboratory at twelve o'clock. It will be a great occasion, Fritz. Von Gruben is coming from Jena, and Hinterstein from Basel. The chief men of science of all South Germany will be there. I shall be punctual, the student said briefly, and so the two parted. The professor plodded homeward, thinking of the great coming event while the young man staggered along after his noisy companions, with his mind full of the blue-eyed Elise, and of the bargain which he had concluded with her father. The professor did not exaggerate when he spoke of the widespread interest excited by his novel psychophysiological experiment. Long before the hour had arrived, the room was filled by a galaxy of talent. Besides the celebrities whom he had mentioned, there had come from London the great Professor Lurcher, who had just established his reputation by a remarkable treatise upon cerebral centres. Several great lights of the spiritualistic body had also come a long distance to be present, 
as had a Swedenborgian minister who considered that the proceedings might throw some light upon the doctrines of the Rosy Cross. There was considerable applause from this eminent assembly upon the appearance of Professor von Baumgarten and his subject upon the platform. The lecturer, in a few well-chosen words, explained what his views were and how he proposed to test them. I hold, he said, that when a person is under the influence of mesmerism, his spirit is for the time released from his body, and I challenge anyone to put forward any other hypothesis which will account for the fact of clairvoyance. I therefore hope that upon mesmerizing my young friend here, and then putting myself into a trance, our spirits may be able to commune together, though our bodies lie still and inert. After a time nature will resume her sway, our spirits will return to our respective bodies, and all will be as before. With your kind permission, we shall now proceed to attempt the experiment. The applause was renewed at this speech, and the audience settled down in expectant silence. With a few rapid passes, the professor mesmerized the young man, who sank back in his chair, pale and rigid. He then took a bright globe of glass from his pocket, and by concentrating his gaze upon it and making a strong mental effort, he succeeded in throwing himself into the same condition. It was a strange and impressive sight to see the old man and the young sitting together in the same cataleptic condition. Whither, then, had their souls fled? That was the question which presented itself to each and every one of these spectators. Five minutes passed, and then ten and then fifteen, and then fifteen more, while the professor and his pupil sat stiff and stark upon the platform. During that time not a sound was heard from the assembled savants, but every eye was bent upon the two pale faces in search of the first signs of returning consciousness. Nearly an hour had elapsed before the patient watchers were rewarded, a faint flush came back to the cheeks of Professor von Baumgarten. The soul was coming back once more to its earthly tenement. Suddenly he stretched out his long, thin arms, as one awaking from sleep, and rubbing his eyes, stood up from his chair and gazed about him, as though he hardly realised where he was. Tausend Teufel! he exclaimed, rapping out a tremendous South German oath to the great astonishment of his audience, and to the disgust of the Swedenborgian. "'Where the henker am I, then, and what in thunder has occurred? Oh, yes, I remember now, one of these nonsensical mesmeric experiments. There is no result this time, for I remember nothing at all since I became unconscious. So you have had all your long journeys for nothing, my learned friends, and a very good joke, too.' at which the Regis Professor of Physiology burst into a roar of laughter and slapped his thigh in a highly indecorous fashion. The audience were so enraged by this unseemly behaviour on the part of their host that there might have been a considerable disturbance, had it not been for the judicious interference of young Fritz von Hartmann, who had now recovered from his lethargy, Stepping to the front of the platform, the young man apologised for the conduct of his companion. "'I am sorry to say,' he said, "'that he is a harem-scarum sort of fellow. Although he appeared so grave at the commencement of this experiment, he is still suffering from mesmeric reaction, and is hardly accountable for his words. As to the experiment itself, I do not consider it to be a failure. It is very possible that our spirits may have been communing in space during this hour.' But unfortunately our gross bodily memory is distinct from our spirit, and we cannot recall what has occurred. My energies shall now be devoted to devising some means by which spirits may be able to recollect what occurs to them in their free state. And I trust that when I have worked this out, I may have the pleasure of meeting you all once again, 
in this hall and demonstrating to you the result. This address, coming from so young a student, caused considerable astonishment among the audience, and some were inclined to be offended, thinking that he assumed rather too much importance. The majority, however, looked upon him as a young man of great promise, and many comparisons were made as they left the hall between his dignified conduct and the levity of his professor, who during the above remarks was laughing heartily in a corner, by no means abashed at the failure of the experiment. Now, although all these learned men were filing out of the lecture-room under the impression that they had seen nothing of note, as a matter of fact, one of the most wonderful things in the whole history of the world had just occurred before their very eyes. Professor von Baumgarten had been so far correct in his theory that both his spirit and that of his pupil had been, for a time, absent from his body. But here a strange and unforeseen complication had occurred. In their return, the spirit of Fritz von Hartmann had entered into the body of Alexis von Baumgarten, and that of Alexis von Baumgarten had taken up its abode in the frame of Fritz von Hartmann. Hence the slang and scurrility which issued from the lips of the serious professor, and hence also the weighty words and grave statements which fell from the careless student. It was an unprecedented event yet no one knew of it, least of all those whom it concerned. The body of the professor, feeling conscious suddenly of a great dryness about the back of the throat, sallied out into the street, still chuckling to himself over the result of the experiment, for the soul of Fritz within was reckless at the thought of the bride whom he had won so easily. His first impulse was to go up to the house and see her. But on second thoughts he came to the conclusion that it would be best to stay away until Madame Baumgarten should be informed by her husband of the agreement which had been made. He therefore made his way down to the Gruner Mann, which was one of the favourite trysting places of the wilder students, and ran, boisterously waving his cane in the air, into the little parlour, where sat Spiegler and Muller and half a dozen other boon companions. "'Ha, ha, my boys!' he shouted. "'I knew I should find you here. Drink up every one of you and call for what you like, for I'm going to stand treat today.' Had the green man, who is depicted upon the signpost of that well-known inn, suddenly marched into the room and called for a bottle of wine, the students could not have been more amazed than they were by this unexpected entry of their revered professor. They were so astonished that for a minute or two they glared at him in utter bewilderment, without being able to make any reply to his hearty invitation. "'Donner and Blitzen!' shouted the professor angrily. "'What the deuce is the matter with you, then? "'You sit there like a set of stuck pigs staring at me. "'What is it, then?' "'It is the unexpected honour," stammered Spiegel, who was in the chair. Honour, Rubbish!' said the professor testily. "'Do you think that just because I happen to have been exhibiting mesmerism "'to a parcel of old fossils, I am therefore too proud to associate with dear old friends like you? "'Come out of that chair, Spiegel, my boy, for I shall preside now. "'Beer or wine, or schnapps, my lads, call for what you like, and put it all down to me.' "'Never was there such an afternoon in the Gruner Mann. "'The foaming flagons of lager,' and the green-necked bottles of Rhenish circulated merrily. By degrees the students lost their shyness in the presence of their professor. As for him, he shouted, he sang, he roared, he balanced a long tobacco pipe upon his nose, and offered to run a hundred yards against any member of the company. The kellner and the barmaid whispered to each other outside the door their astonishment at such proceedings on the part of a regis professor of the ancient university of Kineplatz. They had still more to whisper about afterwards, for the learned man cracked the kellner's crown, 
and kissed the barmaid behind the kitchen door. "'Gentlemen,' said the professor, standing up, albeit somewhat totteringly, at the end of the table, and balancing his high old-fashioned wine-glass in his bony hand, "'I must now explain to you what is the cause of this festivity.' "'Hear, hear!' roared the students, hammering their beer-glasses against the table. "'A speech! A speech! Silence for a speech! "'The fact is, my friends,' said the professor, beaming through his spectacles, "'I hope very soon to be married.' "'Married?' cried a student, bolder than the others. "'Is Madame dead, then?' "'Madame who?' "'Why, Madame von Baumgarten, of course.' "'Ha-ha!' laughed the professor. "'I can see, then, that you know all about my former difficulties. "'No, she is not dead, but I have reason to believe that she will not oppose my marriage.' "'That is very accommodating of her,' remarked one of the company. "'In fact,' said the professor, "'I hope that she will now be induced to aid me in getting a wife. "'She and I never took to each other very much.' but now I hope all that may be ended, and when I marry she will come and stay with me. What a happy family! exclaimed some wag. Yes, indeed, and I hope you will come to my wedding, all of you. I won't mention names, but here is to my little bride. And the professor waved his glass in the air. Here's to his little bride, roared the roisterers with shouts of laughter. Here's her health, sie soll leben, hoch! and so the fun waxed still more fast and furious, while each young fellow followed the professor's example and drank a toast to the girl of his heart. While all this festivity had been going on at the Gruner Mann, a very different scene had been enacted elsewhere. Young Fritz von Hartmann, with a solid face and a reserved manner, had, after the experiment, consulted and adjusted some mathematical instruments. After which, with a few peremptory words to the janitors, he had walked out into the street and wended his way slowly in the direction of the house of the professor. As he walked, he saw von Althaus, the professor of anatomy, in front of him, and quickening his pace, he overtook him. "'I say, von Althaus,' he exclaimed, tapping him on the sleeve. You were asking me for some information the other day concerning the middle coat of the cerebral arteries. Now I find Donnerwetter, shouted von Althaus, who was a peppery old fellow. What the deuce do you mean by your impertinence? I'll have you up before the academical senate for this, sir. With which threat he turned on his heels and hurried away. Von Hartmann was much surprised at this reception. It's on account of this failure of my experiment he said to himself, and continued moodily on his way. Fresh surprises were in store for him, however. He was hurrying along when he was overtaken by two students. These youths, instead of raising their caps or showing any other sign of respect, gave a wild whoop of delight the instant that they saw him, and rushing at him, seized him by each arm, and commenced dragging him along with them. "'Got in Himmel!' roared von Hartmann. "'What is the meaning of this unparalleled insult? Where are you taking me?' "'To crack a bottle of wine with us,' said the two students. "'Come along. That is an invitation which you have never refused.' "'I never heard of such insolence in my life!' cried von Hartmann. Let go my arms. I shall certainly have you rusticated for this. Let me go, I say. And he kicked furiously at his captors. Oh, if you choose to turn ill-tempered, you may go where you like, the student said, releasing him. We can do very well without you. I know you. I'll pay you out, said von Hartmann furiously, and continued in the direction which he imagined to be his own home much incensed at the two episodes which had occurred to him on the way. Now Madame von Baumgarten, who was looking out of the window and wondering why her husband was late for dinner, was considerably astonished to see the young student come stalking down the road. As already remarked, she had a great antipathy to him, and if ever he ventured into the house, it was on sufferance and under the protection of the professor. 
Still more astonished was she, therefore, when she beheld him undo the wicket gate and stride up the garden path with the air of one who is master of the situation. She could hardly believe her eyes and hastened to the door with all her maternal instincts up in arms. From the upper windows the fair Elise had also observed this daring move upon the part of her lover, and her heart beat quick with mingled pride and consternation. "'Good day, sir,' Madame Baumgarten remarked to the intruder as she stood in gloomy majesty in the open doorway. "'A very fine day indeed, Martha,' returned the other. "'Now don't stand there like a statue of Juno, but bustle about and get the dinner ready, for I am well-nigh starved.' "'Martha? Dinner?' ejaculated the lady, falling back in astonishment. "'Yes, dinner, Martha, dinner!' howled von Hartmann, who was becoming irritable. "'Is there anything wonderful in that request, when a man has been out all day? I'll wait in the dining-room. Anything will do, shinken and sausage and prunes, any little thing that happens to be about. There you are, standing, staring again. Woman, will you or will you not stir your legs?' This last address delivered with a perfect shriek of rage, had the effect of sending good Madame Baumgarten flying along the passage and through the kitchen, where she locked herself up in the scullery and went into violent hysterics. In the meantime, von Hartmann strode into the room and threw himself down upon the sofa in the worst of tempers. Elise, he shouted. Confound the girl! Elise! Thus roughly summoned, the young lady came timidly downstairs and into the presence of her lover. Dearest, she cried, throwing her arms round him, I know this is all done for my sake. It is a ruse in order to see me. Von Hartmann's indignation at this fresh attack upon him was so great that he became speechless for a minute from rage, and could only glare and shake his fists, while he struggled in her embrace. When he at last regained his utterance, he indulged in such a bellow of passion that the young lady dropped back, petrified with fear, into an armchair. "'Never have I passed such a day in my life,' von Hartmann cried, stamping upon the floor. "'My experiment has failed. Von Althaus has insulted me. Two students have dragged me along the public road.' My wife nearly faints when I ask her for dinner, and my daughter flies at me and hugs me like a grisly bear. You are ill, dear, the young lady cried. Your mind is wandering. You have not even kissed me once. No, and I don't intend to either, von Hartmann said with decision. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Why don't you go and fetch my slippers and help your mother to dish the dinner? And is it for this? Elise cried, burying her face in her handkerchief. Is it for this that I have loved you passionately for upwards of ten months? Is it for this that I have braved my mother's wrath? Oh, you've broken my heart. I'm sure you have. And she sobbed hysterically. I can't stand much more of this, roared von Hartmann furiously. What the deuce does the girl mean? What did I do ten months ago which inspired you with such a particular affection for me? If you are really so very fond, you would do better to run away down and find the shinken and some bread instead of talking all this nonsense. Oh, my darling, cried the unhappy maiden, throwing herself into the arms of what she imagined to be her lover. You do but joke in order to frighten your little Elise. Now it chanced that at the moment of this unexpected embrace, von Hartmann was still leaning back against the end of the sofa, which, like much German furniture, was in a somewhat rickety condition. It also chanced that beneath this end of the sofa there stood a tank full of water, in which the physiologist was conducting certain experiments upon the over of fish, which he kept in his drawing-room in order to ensure an equable temperature. The additional weight of the maiden, combined with the impetus with which she hurled herself upon him, caused the precarious piece of furniture to give way, and the body of the unfortunate student was hurled backwards into the tank, 
in which his head and shoulders were firmly wedged, while his lower extremities flapped helplessly about in the air. This was the last straw. Extricating himself with some difficulty from his unpleasant position, von Hartmann gave an inarticulate yell of fury, and dashing out of the room, in spite of the entreaties of Elise, he seized his hat and rushed off into the town, all dripping and dishevelled, with the intention of seeking in some inn the food and comfort which he could not find at home. As the spirit of von Baumgarten, encased in the body of von Hartmann, strode down the winding pathway which led down to the little town, brooding angrily over his many wrongs, he became aware that an elderly man was approaching him, who appeared to be in an advanced state of intoxication. Von Hartmann waited by the side of the road and watched this individual, who came stumbling along, reeling from one side of the road to the other, and singing a student song in a very husky and drunken voice. At first his interest was merely excited by the fact of seeing a man of so venerable an appearance in such a disgraceful condition, but as he approached nearer he became convinced that he knew the other well, though he could not recall when or where he had met him. This impression became so strong with him that when the stranger came abreast of him he stepped in front of him and took a good look at his features. "'Well, Sonny,' said the drunken man, surveying von Hartmann and swaying about in front of him, "'where the henker have I seen you before? I know you as well as I know myself. Who the deuce are you?' "'I am Professor von Baumgarten,' said the student. "'May I ask who you are? I'm strangely familiar with your features.' "'You should never tell lies, young man,' said the other. "'You're certainly not the professor, for he is an ugly, snuffy old chap, "'and you are a big, broad-shouldered young fellow. "'As to myself, I am Fritz von Hartmann at your service.' "'That you certainly are not,' exclaimed the body of von Hartmann. "'You might very well be his father. "'But hello, sir, are you aware that you are wearing my studs and my watch-chain?' Donavetta, hiccuped the other. "'If those are not the trousers for which my tailor is about to sue me, may I never taste beer again?' Now, as von Hartmann, overwhelmed by the many strange things which had occurred to him that day, passed his hand over his forehead and cast his eyes downwards, he chanced to catch the reflection of his own face in a pool which the rain had left upon the road. To his utter astonishment he perceived that his face was that of a youth, that his dress was that of a fashionable young student, and that in every way he was the antithesis of the grave and scholarly figure in which his mind was wont to dwell. In an instant his active brain ran over the series of events which had occurred, and sprang to the conclusion. He fairly reeled under the blow. Himmel, he cried, I see it all. Our souls are in the wrong bodies. I am you, and you are I. My theory is proved. But at what an expense! Is the most scholarly mind in Europe to go about with this frivolous exterior? Oh, the labours of a lifetime are ruined! And he smote his breast in his despair. I say remarked the real von Hartmann from the body of the professor. I quite see the force of your remarks, but don't go knocking my body about like that. You received it in excellent condition. But I perceive that you have wet it and bruised it and spilled snuff over my ruffled shirt front. It matters little, the other said moodily. Such as we are, so we must stay. My theory is triumphantly proved, but the cost is terrible. If I thought so, said the spirit of the student, it would be hard indeed. What could I do with these stiff old limbs? And how could I woo Elise and persuade her that I was not her father? 
No, thank heaven, in spite of the beer, which has upset me more than ever it could upset my real self. I can't see a way out of it. How? gasped the professor. Why, by repeating the experiment. Liberate our souls once more, and the chances are that they will find their way back into their respective bodies. No drowning man could clutch more eagerly at a straw than did von Baumgarten's spirit at this suggestion. In feverish haste he dragged his own frame to the side of the road and threw it into a mesmeric trance. He then extracted the crystal ball from the pocket and managed to bring himself into the same condition. Some students and peasants, who chanced to pass during the next hour, were much astonished to see the worthy professor of physiology and his favourite student both sitting upon a very muddy bank and both completely insensible. Before the hour was up, quite a crowd had assembled, and they were discussing the advisability of sending for an ambulance to convey the pair to hospital, when the learned savant opened his eyes and gazed vacantly around him. For an instant he seemed to forget how he had come there, but next moment he astonished his audience by waving his skinny arms above his head and crying out in a voice of rapture, Gott sei gedankt, I am myself again. I feel I am. Nor was the amazement lessened when the student, springing to his feet, burst into the same cry, and the two performed a sort of pas de joie in the middle of the road. For some time after that, people had some suspicion of the sanity of both the actors in this strange episode. When the professor published his experiences in the Medical Schrift, as he had promised, he was met by an intimation, even from his colleagues, that he would do well to have his mind cared for, and that another such publication would certainly consign him to a madhouse. The student also found by experience that it was wisest to be silent about the matter. When the worthy lecturer returned home that night, he did not receive the cordial welcome which he might have looked for after his strange adventures. On the contrary, he was roundly upbraided by both his female relatives for smelling of drink and tobacco, and also for being absent while a young scapegrace invaded the house and insulted its occupants. It was long before the domestic atmosphere of the lecturer's house resumed its normal quiet, and longer still before the genial face of von Hartmann was seen beneath its roof. Perseverance, however, conquers every obstacle, and the student eventually succeeded in pacifying the enraged ladies and in establishing himself upon the old footing. He has now no longer any cause to fear the enmity of Madame, for he is Hauptmann von Hartmann of the Emperor's own Uhlans, and his loving wife Elise has already presented him with two little Uhlans, as a visible sign and token of her affection. That is the end of the great Kynplatz experiment by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle Read by Greg Wagland for Magpie Audio 2023 Thanks for listening.